As a proud partner of the Reading League and the Science of Reading Coalition, Lexia Learning is excited to announce Letters Literacy Professional Learning is now available through Lexia. Lexia joined forces with Voyager Sopris Learning to exclusively offer letters, developed by renowned educator Dr. Louisa Motes and other literacy experts. For more information about how Letters is part of Lexia, visit lexialearning.com slash L-E-T-R-S. That's lexialearning.com slash L-E-T-R-S. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Teaching, Reading, and Learning, the TRL podcast. I'm Laura Stewart, your host. The focus of this podcast is to have important conversations around education, specifically focused on inspiring, informing, and elevating contributions to teaching and learning. Our guest today is Dr. Tracy Whedon, and I've had the pleasure of getting to know Tracy just this past year. And I just have to tell you, I'm just so delighted to have this conversation with her today. As a way of introducing Tracy, I would like to read her bio to you. Dr. Tracy Whedon is a seasoned and passionate leader dedicated to advancing literacy and academic excellence for children and adults. With an EdD in educational leadership, Tracy has spent her career creating and building innovative programs, systems, and teams focused on providing enhanced learning opportunities and exceptional outcomes for children. Tracy is a true visionary when it comes to improving the world through education. Her innovative style of leadership, combined with her compassionate and engaging nature, enables her to successfully manage change and growth across a diverse constituent base, including boards of trustees, donors, staff, parents, teachers, educational partners, and students. In her current role as president and CEO of Nye House, she provides leadership and support in the areas of financial management, recruitment and development of staff, fundraising initiatives, initiating and furthering relationships with NEC partners, and guidance of professional and public relations. Prior to joining Nye House, Tracy was the Executive Director of Academic Planning with Scholastic Achievement Partners. In this capacity, Dr. Whedon provided executive consulting nationally on the development of systems that help school districts improve student achievement and address barriers to rigorous, relevant learning. Prior to Scholastic Achievement Partners, she spent more than five years as the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment for the Houston Independent School District. What an impressive career you have had, Tracy, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Laura. Well, I thought we'd just jump right in, and I'd love to hear from you a quote that you live by and return to. The quote I live by is a quote that was planted in my heart by my father, and um, I am a PK, a preacher's kid, so it is a spiritual quote, and it is, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And that is exactly what's happened in my life. Um, And that path changes over time. It's never the same. You know, every day is a new adventure, an opportunity to get anchored to those core values that I intend to live by and let those be the guiding light for my path moving forward and um, making sure that I'm bringing light and life with my words and my actions. And when I fall, get up brush off, seek that wisdom and keep moving along that path. That is lovely. Just lovely. I love the idea of light and life, bringing light and life to your work. And, you know, again, I've, I've, I've known you this past year and I just feel that from you, Tracy. I feel that. I feel that, that you have that inner guidance. So thank you. Thank you for starting us off with that. Um, I'd also like to, sh- you know, I really would like to share with our listeners kind of your background. What made you decide to go into education? 
You know, be careful what you speak over your children because it, it becomes true. It becomes their script. So my dad, the same man, used to tease me. I was excruciatingly thin when I was growing up. And so he used to say, you're going to be a teacher because you carry your pencils with you, my little skinny legs. And I would laugh. I'm like, oh, dad, okay. Well, ironically enough, <laughs> that was exactly what happened. And I've always been a bit of a teacher because I'm the oldest of seven. And so I was mama number two in the household and I had a ton of responsibility and no regrets about that, but I really learned how to manage a team. Um, when mom and dad left, I had full authority and I exercised that authority at times to the chagrin of my siblings, but um, you know, I've had to back off being the bossy oldest, I can't do that anymore. However, that was my first classroom, if you will. And then from there, I was, um, as a young adult, a cheerleading coach for years. And I went to um, my undergrad study at the University of Detroit thinking I was going to be on radio and television. I wanted to be at that newscaster with the mic. And as I went through the program, I really enjoyed it, but it wasn't, there was something missing right here. And um, I decided in the moment where I had been asking, okay, what am I supposed to do with my life, Daddy? What's the point here? I was doing volunteer work at a community center in inner city Detroit, teaching modern dance to a group of kids from that neighborhood. And I had this epiphany in that moment, you're an educator. And I was at exactly the point where I could make a mid-course adjustment, finish all of my certification coursework in the university and graduate on time. I mean, I know that wasn't an accident that I got that and that answer. And I had had aspirational adults in my path who had also been my models for what it looks like to lead a classroom or lead a group instructionally. And so those seeds have been planted and they started to just blossom. So um, I never looked back. And the ironic thing is even in this moment, all of those skills I gained in undergrad have come to bear on what I get to do now as an ambassador of really transformational work where reading and literacy are concerned. Wow. So you just kind of opened your up, you opened yourself up. I asked the question and I got the answer. And you had this epiphany that you were meant to be a teacher. Yes. Yes. I was missing the point. You know, this idea of, I don't ask young people, what do you want to be when you grow up anymore? I ask them, how do you want to change the world? Because when I answered that question, I was super clear on my path. I love children. I love people. And seeing them elevated to their highest purpose is my reward. And if I get to be a tool on that journey in any way, that is what brings me joy. So it's really, I, I love uh, Stedman Graham's book on um, self-leadership. And he says, you need to build your life around the things you love. I love books. I love literacy. I love how words can transform your life. Just one phrase at the, at the right time can cause your life to just reboot and be re-envisioned and reinvented. And so that's what I get to do. Wow. So I love this asking young people, how do you want to change the world? That is a powerful question. And it's an empowering question, isn't it? Yes. And it's not just about a degree. It's about your purpose and your path and your passion. Yeah. So, so in addition to, so you mentioned Stephen Graham's book, are there other people or places or books or experiences that really influenced you early on? Early on, believe it or not, it was Louisa May Alcott. Little Women, that whole series. And, you know, I have a lot of sisters, so I could so relate to her and her boldness and her frailty and her finding her path and her sisters and their uniqueness. And I could, even, even though culturally, I mean, it was so dynamically different to my, from my existence, but there were so many parallels. Uh, also, the C.S. Lewis series, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and that whole, I'm a series gal, so read every single book in that series, and this battle between good and evil, and moments of frailty and failure, and then again, reinventing oneself out of that failure, it, it taught me so much. Um, 
I would say uh, Maya Angelou's work. I know why the caged bird sings and 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 works like that um, that helped me realize that there are no ceilings on who I choose to be unless I put them there. And pain can actually lead to passion. Um, you know, we can either get better or we can get bitter. And I, I refuse to allow anyone to define my narrative. I get to define what my narrative will be and explore that narrative and share that narrative in a way that hopefully brings hope to other people. Um, but right now, the book um, um, I've fallen in love with is Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Such a good book and, and a, a way to exercise tools to be brave, to ask questions that are that white elephant sitting in the front room underlined in multicolor by COVID. You know, we have to have those rumbles and those real raw respectful conversations about what really matters. And I want to make sure I have the tools to have those conversations. Yeah, I love this. So, so when you think about, so, you know, I love the better, not bitter. That's really nice. The idea that you can define your narrative and explore your narrative and change your narrative. That's another really empowering thing. Um, and I also have to say, I, I really, I love Louise May Alcott as well. Little Women was one of my favorite books, you know, growing up. How many sisters did you have, by the way? Um, there are five sisters, two brothers. Um, two of my siblings are deceased, um, and I sure do miss them. The joy of growing up in that big, lively household is just such an incredible blessing. And then you have these built-in besties for life. So... Um, I feel very fortunate to have been born into the family I was born into. And you and you led the pack. <laughs> I led it. I tried my best to do it because I was going to be responsible if it didn't work. So you know, but I, but accountability was well in place. But that was all of that was, I think, just part of my path in preparation for what I get to do today. I, it just feels like you're you're a very, um, you know, you're a very strong believer in this idea of letting the path unfold. Um, and and trusting that path and listening to the guidance behind that path. That's really nice, Tracy. It's lovely. Absolutely. It's lovely. Yes. Um, and I wanted to mention, you know, when I read your bio, you, you mentioned your work focuses on addressing barriers to rigorous, relevant learning. So I wonder if you could share with us what you've learned and how you have overcome about overcoming barriers. You know, I learned from my visionary mother and my father that poverty does not define us. They came out of abject poverty, days where they didn't know where their next meal would be coming from, um, dealing with barriers to learning um, that you would typically see in a high poverty situation. But they had this vision that was bigger than the circumstances they were born into. And what fascinates me is my mother had this sense that literacy was our ticket out of those circumstances. And so we lived a very modest childhood, um, but we ate very well. <laughs> my mom was the one who would go to the health food store and buy flaxseed and all the things she, she would study up on how to make our brains as bright as possible. And so she would grind flaxseed and put it in spaghetti sauce. I mean, she was way ahead of her size. I was just going like, to say oh, that I was kind of ahead of her time. Food. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't have sugar. So we'd go to school and, and we would be, we beg for sugar from our friends. You know, if you have any candy, cause she wouldn't cook with sugar. She was way, way ahead of her time. Um, but she wanted us to have all the advantages that she did not have. And so as a stay at home mom, um, I would come home to bread therapy. She would bake bread from scratch for us. And she'd slather it with butter and honey and sit down and just kind of help us process our day. That was my normal. And um, I thought that was going to be going to be my normal too, but it didn't turn out that way. Not a stay at home mom, but so grateful that she, she saw and sought out what, what middle-class families did, like going to the library. So we had before Oprah's book club, there was Bessie's book club. And we all became voracious readers and we would exchange books and have these conversations. And 
she would have us um, read to her orally. Now, I didn't know she was a struggling reader because she went to probably 14 different schools growing up because of the adverse circumstances of her childhood. And so she had gaps in her own learning, but she was absolutely sure we wouldn't. We had one parent volunteer in our elementary school in our neighborhood school, my mom. And she built relationships with the best teachers to make sure she could get us into those best classes. I mean, she was just, it, it just blows my mind. Um, and then my dad had a severe stutter and he went to a Toastmasters club and then he would bring back all the tongue twisters and all the speeches and we would give the speeches at home. So I think about, I call it the currency of the 21st century. If we can read in the language of power, write in the language of power and express our ideas in the language of power, we have a place at the table. And that was the currency I was given. When I look at my extended um, uh, village, if you will, many of those people I grew up with became collateral damage to a lack of literacy. And so I had a decision to make, am I going to pay that privilege forward, literacy privilege forward? I am compelled to do that because I could easily be a statistic, but I'm not. And the seven of us were not. And I believe the literacy was what defined our path. And, you know, even though the research says that our brain is not wired for reading, Laura, I believe our spirits are wired for reading. We just can't prove it yet. How can someone read a book and their life be completely reinvented? It's because that spirit in us is that tuning fork for words. Tracy, I, I love that so much. And I want to read this tweet that you recently sent out because you, you, you tweeted this. You said, our brains do not appear to be wired for reading, but I believe our spirits are. When they are planted in our souls, spoken and written words change our destiny. That is why access to literacy and science of reading must be a fundamental human right. That's so beautifully said, beautifully said. And, you know, that's something, to be honest, even though this has been my life's work as well, I've really never thought about it that way. I've never thought about how our spirits are wired for that. And I really think that's a powerful message for us as educators to really take to heart. Absolutely. If, if we don't get anything else right as leaders, and teachers who, by the way, if you're listening, you are a VIP. Don't ever say I'm just a teacher. You are a person who transforms lives. And um, I don't know why my printer's deciding to go off now, but be quiet. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm you in. Um, literally, you transform the family tree when you get literacy right. And ironically enough, you know, it's really the cornerstone of all learning. It is the mother that brings life into every other content area. Sadly, when we are being apprenticed as leaders or as teachers, who really apprentices us to scale the work of literacy responsibly? How do we reinvent what we're doing in university so that as a superintendent in pre pre preparing for the work, I know how to intentionally scale the work of literacy well, and then I can build on that foundation anything I dream for my students. But if we don't do that, then college readiness and even workforce readiness and certification pathways, that's smoke and mirrors. It's just not real. And it should not be dependent upon the zip code a child comes from the dialect they're loved in, or the language they're loved in. Say that again. It should not, say that again. It should not depend on the zip code, the dialect the child is loved in, or the zip code that they are loved in. It should not matter. And when we do that work well, it's our moonshot. It's our national moonshot to, to transform Imagine if we were the most literate country in the world. What would happen if we could think critically and be shaped by words that bring life? We would be a completely different nation. Yes, we would. 
And I think you are such an articulate spokesperson for that. Um, I want to read something else that you recently posted on Twitter that I just, I cherish. Um, you wrote, the first and most important job of a student is learning to read. The first and foremost and most important job of a leader is scaling the work of literacy responsibly. Reading is the cornerstone of learning for a lifetime. And I've also heard you, as you said, you know, literacy is the civil right of the 21st century. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So if, if, if this is, and I, you know, I think what you say is so true and so passionate and so, um, so inspiring. What is getting in our way? What do you think is really getting in our way, Tracy? I want to go back to Laura, another quote my dad, a wise word my dad gave me. And it's for lack of vision, the people perish. And if you go back to the original Hebrew, it means they cast off restraint. They fail to self-regulate. They fail to remain disciplined and focused about the things that will make a difference. So that's one dynamic. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And so it's about being humble enough to admit that and seeking those answers relentlessly until we get them. Finding the systems that are doing this work well. Go walk that building, talk with the district leadership, find out how they've done this work and then replicate it for your system in a way that is responsible and uh, responsive to the culture of your district or your school. That's, it, this work takes a lot of humility. Secondly, I believe adult egos get in the way. In other words, I'm a new leader. Am I about the work and the children and sustainable change, or I'm about promoting myself? And so a sign of self-promotion is to come in and not really examine what's working and sticking with what's working, and then strategically abandoning what's not which takes a lot of courage. And I'd say that's the third. It's courage. And what blocks people is fear. And this is an, is an acronym I live by. Fear is often false evidence appearing real. We have to examine our fear, put it in the light, and then determine that we want to walk by faith. And the acronym that I received in my quiet time one morning was, faith is focused adults intervening tenaciously with hope. And when that intervention is at tier one, it's we're going to get first instruction right the first time. And if we do that, we'll identify kids who are dyslexic and then we can intervene for those kids. But the critical mass of kids are going to read on my watch. And we keep hope. Uh, hope is an action word. It is not just a word. And when we activate strategies, we're keeping hope at the forefront of what we do. We refuse to give up. We refuse to quit. So those are the biggest barriers I see. And it's at the university level where egos can get in the way and fear can get in the way of the new. It can be at the district level. It could be at the school or the classroom level. It doesn't matter. It's the same battle. And the battle starts between our ears. We have to think through these things with a shoulder partner who will tell us what's true and what's right. Not what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. And that takes a lot of humility and courage. You know, I, it's interesting. I just had a conversation um, with Jan Hasbrook and we were talking about, you know, humility, curiosity, and collaboration. And you kind of hit on that too. You know, when you said one of the, one of the barriers is recognizing we don't know what we don't know. And that does take humility. And then we have to follow that curiosity, right? What do I need to know? And then we have to find people to collaborate with us to find those answers. Um, I also wanted to mention, uh, I, was, I had a great conversation with the, the wise and wonderful Parker Palmer. And he said that, you know, teaching is this intersection between humility and chutzpah. And I, I, and, I, like and I think that. you really hit on that, right? Because it's, it's being yeah. humble, but also having courage, you know, having that courage to step outside of what might be your known 
or step outside of what might be your comfort and challenge yourself to say, if I'm not reaching all these kids, what what else can I learn? What else can I do? Exactly. You know, who's who who you remember the movie Sophie's Choice with Meryl Streep? Which kid do we pick to fall through the cracks? Which kid do we say we can warehouse you until you end up in the school to prison pipeline? I'm not choosing that particular choice. We choose that they all will have that opportunity. And that means being willing to fail forward and learn forward, giving ourselves permission not to pretend to be the sage on the stage who has all the answers. We don't. And one of the most um, inspirational superintendents I've ever worked with is in the Valley, in Harlingen Consolidated Independent School District. And he says, we have to plan the work and then work the plan. It's not that complicated, but planning the work is really so crucial. And planning that with the shoulder partner who knows the work is so important, he says, because you can do work, but is it the right work? Is it the right work? And and I see some misinformation out there about what the right work is when it comes to teaching the structure of the English language explicitly. I mean, it's the right work. And it doesn't stop with early literacy, it should be an articulated pathway all the way through to when a kid graduates from high school, where the focus is developmentally appropriate, but still very intentional. And when we do that well, the fastest improving systems I've seen in the country, and I've worked from coast to coast, from DC public schools to Compton USD, when they get literacy right across the content areas, you see dramatic growth and change regardless of the population that is being served. Right. So so tell us a little bit more about, I mean, pick one of those experiences. You said you've worked coast to coast. I know you worked in districts to help really transform those districts. Um, can you give us a, 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 a specific example? Absolutely. So um, I, will, I will use Harlingen um, in what happened with that superintendent. So he was humble enough to realize I, my team and I don't know what to do with this. We have 64% of our kids in pre-K kinder ready after a year of instruction. That means uh, about a third of them are being left out of the loop and that's not acceptable on my watch. So we sat down with Dr. Cavazos and his leadership team and we looked at their data. When we looked at their data, we knew the kind of targeted instruction they would need. And we recognized that it needed to be not just the teachers, with the district coaches and the principals who were also looped into the learning. But he says, we first had to sell the problem. And the way they do that is they have design teams. So we were able to work with his, his design team on getting first instruction right, really training those coaches up so they could help sustain the work. And then when we launched into the work over a two year period, they went from 64% kinder ready to 95% kinder ready. In two years in the Valley where the critical mass of their kids are English language learners. So if we can do it there, it can be done anywhere. The beauty of the way they do things though, in data-driven decision-making, they saw the next year, they dropped to 91%. And so they dug into the data and what they found was several principals had taken the highly trained teachers and put them in tested grades. So, That's something I learned when I was an assistant superintendent in HISD. The highest performing high poverty schools made sure that the early grades had the best teachers in place. And they understood that if they laid that literacy foundation well, then the test is is not the biggest barrier. The biggest barrier is creating gaps unintentionally in the early grades. And so then they circled back to these principals and said, this is a non-negotiable. We are investing in early literacy and you're undermining your own success. They are such a great example. And there's a succession plan in place so that as he transitions out of the district, he has been apprenticing and working with the new superintendent so that there's a seamless transition so that the work continues in a sustainable way. Then we focused on special education and dyslexia. So there's effectively, I call it a literacy safety net that no child can fall through the cracks. When districts do that, 
and they articulate all tiers of instruction so there's alignment and sustainability in place. Double digit growth and amazing change. I'm, I'm so glad you described that because I, I really believe one of the things that's getting in our way as well in terms of you know us kind of nationally moving forward um, is the is that we have a lack of stories like that. I think there there's something really powerful in story. Um, you know, I, I think we can't beat people over the head with research. I think it really has to be grounded in story, has to be grounded in narrative. And you, you know, you hit on so many important things that are critical to the success. Number one, a visionary leader who will not accept that kids are falling through the cracks. Number two, a relentless look at data, you know, constantly going back to the data. What does the data show us and how do we use that to inform us? The third, the third importance of teamwork and making sure every, all hands are on deck and, you know, the early grades have these really strong teachers so that we don't create a gap that's insurmountable in third, fourth, whatever grade and a succession plan. You know, how do you keep this going? Because I was, I was recently talking to a, um, a superintendent and he said, you know, the thing is we really learned is you cannot take your foot off the gas. It's not like, it's not like you arrive. You know, it's not like you say, we, we got this all figured out. You know, we're good forever. Never arrive. Never arrive. You know, something else you said, Laura, that triggered a thought. And I, I, I understand this all too well. We can work in silos and the silo effect is deadly. It really overtaxes the system and causes initiative overload. So if special education is demanding from central office this and the EL department that and you know curriculum and instruction and it's overwhelming. God bless principals out there trying to do the work. So if we will map our work and break down those silos to understand what we're asking and we create coherence, a strategic communication plan is crucial for districts. It's the same challenge I have as you know, the head of a nonprofit. The communication is absolutely important, but it's such a habit to work in silos and we waste funding, we waste time, we waste our amazing people power. And what I found in the districts that get that right and they map the resources and they calibrate across um, departments, they recapture funding that would otherwise be lost. I used to look at cumulative funding loss data with district leaders. It's striking how millions of dollars are wasted because kids give up in middle and high school and they drop out. So the title funds walk out with them. And when we get literacy right in the early grades, they recapture that funding and they can focus it on not just excellent first instruction, but enrichment for all. That's the opportunity. Oh my gosh, this is so enlightening. Yeah, so the, the silos being deadly are you know, there's really a couple of things going on here. One is initiative overload. And the second is the financial drain that could be better utilized. Um, again, if we get this right in the early grades, then we have more available resources to continue to support our kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to support our kids and kids, teachers are not as likely to give up on the profession. That's the other thing I, I would love some research behind is when they succeed, you know, teachers don't come to the profession and say, I want to be a loser. They come and say, I want to win for kids. And when they do, they want to stick with it. So the systems that do this well, their teachers don't leave. They stick around. Yeah. So do you think, I and that's funny, that, that was a question I was just going to ask you. So how do we, how do we retain and how do we recruit, retain, uh, and um, encourage teachers to stay in the profession and, and, and leaders too, administrators. Um, yes, do, you, do you think yes. the secret, the secret is that success? This, this, that it's, it's, it's the self-perpetuating cycle of success. I love a term that echo Institute uses and they create um, communities of learners. They say you have to figure out what the full uh, forced multiplier is. In my opinion, the forced multiplier is, would be a superintendent who has been apprenticed to scale this work responsibly. Imagine if every superintendent across the country understood the power of the science of reading and doing it intentionally and sustainably. It would be absolutely transformational. Now, that means we have to backload to university preparation programs. And 
how do you reinvent your leadership preparation program so that leaders get that opportunity? But we can't wait on the university. So I think we create conditions where those who want to learn this work can do that. And we're working on that right now. And when we do that, we maintain that community. So they have a Vegas space where they can get together with other superintendents fighting the same battles and have honest discourse about what they're learning and what they're leading. So I think that is the huge opportunity gap that exists nationally that I intend to do something about with our team. Yeah, so, so tell me more about that. So tell me more about your work at Nye House and, and that in particular, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So what I've discovered with my team is that I believe there's a blueprint for success. And there are key variables if they're addressed and, 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 and it's sequential and then it's also about mid-course adjustments because we can't just be on automatic as leaders with this work. You have to anticipate those who are going to push back. Um, the, doctor, the work of Dr. Anthony Mohammed, I love, he talks about how you have believers, your first adopters, who have the right value system to support the work. You have your tweeners who are waiting to see, is this gonna stick around or shall this to pass? And then you have your fundamentalists who are determined to stick with what they're comfortable with, who are not about what's best for kids. So the key is to equip those believers for success, because when you do, the tweeners want to win and they'll come along for the ride and you, create, you build your critical mass of believers and your fundam fundamentalists, as the culture changes, become uncomfortable and they will either leave or be quiet. And so for district leaders, there's this balance of the qualitative dynamics of what's going on and it's the quantitative dynamics where we're looking at our formative and some of the assessment data to drive what we're doing next. It's a balance between those two indicators to guide our next steps and to look at what the shifts are that are occurring. The other thing, Laura, that we have to be alert to is what are those perception, perception gaps that exist? The best ones to ask about that are our children. Do we have a way to intentionally survey our students to see what they think is happening what the teachers say is happening and the leaders and the perception gap and closing that perception gap over time, qualitatively and quantitatively. So what is the customer experience for students? Because they are ultimately our customer. <laughs> That's a good point. It, they, are, they are the clientele. They are the clientele, right? And how do we best serve, how do we best serve our clientele? That's a, that's a, I like this perception gap idea is something that's that seems very very um, kind of novel to me. I love this idea. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, at one point, um, I worked with um, when I was with Scholastic Achievement Partners. We had surveys that we would use to uh, find out from different stakeholders what their experience was in, uh, during an initiative, and then we were actually able to look at what that gap was and whether it was being closed and to activate strategies that were meaningful to each stakeholder group to make that happen. And often we just drive, we're driven by numbers, but we miss the story you said earlier, what's the narrative underneath? Because perception becomes reality. We may, we may not agree with it and it may not be completely accurate, but it's the, it's the perception. It's, and it's, so it is somebody's reality, that. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's somebody's reality. And parents, that's the fourth leg of the stool, family engagement. And, and what I love about our work is we get to look at this work holistically. We want to build teacher knowledge, leader knowledge, partner with universities. We have university partners. But what about that parent who's desperate for support? Maybe their kid is undiagnosed and dyslexic. We have a family support office to help that parent. What if the parent is dyslexic and never learned to read? We have adult literacy programs. So at night, dyslexia therapists deliver instruction so adults can learn to read. And they can do it virtually now because COVID forced us to go into what I call our COVID chrysalis. I told my team, we've got to reinvent ourselves. We have a mission to fulfill. How do we do that? Because we can't let COVID stop us. And they rose to the occasion. We were able to shift to a virtual delivery system that included virtual coaching and adult literacy support. And it's going really, really well. And so the thing is, it, it creates a whole new way 
to deliver services. And we have our first group of teachers in training from Hong Kong of all places because we were able to make that pivot. Well, I do think that's that's been um, part of the gift of this time is that we've, we all had to pivot and go into that virtual space, but then look at how many other, how many people we can reach. Um, that's been- How many we can reach. Yes, and, and nonprofits like, like ours really deserve philanthropic support because it, it, it created a, an incubation lab for new ideas because we couldn't deliver services the way we had before. And if people really care about the future of our country and nation building, we're the kind of organizations to invest in to create intentional spaces for us to continue to reinvent the work and reinvent the future. When I love your, when you talk about the, the four legs of the stool, so you, you, serve, you serve children, you serve parents in not only how to support their children, but you also serve them as readers, right? It sounds like you offer services to them. Yeah, well, we actually have um, funding to provide for children who need dyslexia therapy, and we have therapists who can serve them. Um, there's not nearly enough for that work, of course but we do some of that work. Our force multiplier is to empower teachers who can, and leaders. And teachers, right, and leaders. So that they can become really apprentice to, to do this work well. That's our whole force multiplier. And in terms of preventing the failure of leaders and teachers, it's partnering with universities who are brave and bold enough to reinvent how they're preparing teachers and leaders for the work. And if they, I think university, same principle. If you are preparing teachers across the content areas to get literacy right, let's say I'm a math teacher. Can I apprentice students in the literacy of my content area so they can read like a mathematician, speak like a mathematician, and present their ideas like a mathematician? You know how you hear this idea, I'm not a reading teacher. Yes, yes you, are. you are. You are responsible for apprenticing them in the literacy of your content area. So they deserve to be equipped to do that work well. And if we're not doing it, we need to be about the business of making it happen. Oh my gosh, I love it. So you're doing some amazing work at the center in with all the with all these different stakeholders. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I, I'm very thankful, very blessed. And and the team that I get to work with, they're just unbelievably relentless, committed. Uh, all about outgoing concern for anybody in front of us to make a difference. Well, I, one of the things I'll definitely do in the show notes is put um, your website so people can learn more about the work that you're doing. Um, so, so Tracy, um, you've hit on so many just amazing themes. Um, I want to, I want to reiterate those little acronyms you shared with us, the acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. I love that because then that gives us, that kind of helps us overcome our fear. If it's appearing real, right? That gives us a little power to get in there and overcome. And then I like faith, focused adults intervening tenaciously with hope. Did I get that right? Yes, you got it, perfect. <laughs> I love it. So, um, so Tracy, when you think about kind of the arc of your work, your whole career, you know, what are the hopes that you have for the work that you do or the work that you have done? What are the greatest hopes you have? The greatest hopes, the greatest hope that I have, I really do this work for the little Bessies and the little Henrys. My mom and dad were out there to be that ally and advocate for them. It is also to inspire and encourage literacy allies to combine forces. And I call, I call them my literacy allies, and it doesn't matter what woman or man suit or suit you were sending you're in, it doesn't matter to me. You can be polka dot. <laughs> but if you're a literacy ally, you know that when people don't have access to that currency, it drains the mind, body, and spirit. And we don't have to accept that as the future for any individual on our watch. We can influence from the middle if we're a teacher and we're outstanding in our work. Someone will come to your classroom and want to do what you're doing for more people, a principal, a superintendent. I call these my lighthouse people, lighthouse districts, 
lighthouse schools, lighthouse classrooms. Be that lighthouse, that beacon of hope to help people navigate the shoals and the rocks and the, and the barriers because it, it makes no sense. When we think about children being cast into a sea of illiteracy and hoping that they'll swim and float. And then if they, if they succumb to those waves, then we're going to administer CPR when we could have taught them the skills in the first place. If, if I can come back to a place, I remember crossing the Pettus Bridge, going to work with a board in that area in Alabama. And I was thinking about my ancestors who gave so much for me to have the opportunities I have today. And to see a place where the critical mass of children could not read on grade level. Thinking back about anti-literacy laws that existed in states in the 1830s. I am the person that they lifted up on their prayers and hopes. And so I'm going to seize this moment and fight this battle and find my allies until I see the change we want to see together. I love that. Tracy, I think you are a lighthouse person. I really do. You are a lighthouse person. Well, Laura, you're my people. So it's so good to be uh, with an ally like you today. It, it just um, is the highlight of my week. There's so much richness in what you've said. And I, I hope that those people who are listening to this are as inspired and humbled and grateful as I am for this conversation. I really, I, I mean that from my heart. Um, Thank you. Thank so you. I want to ask you some closing questions. And actually, I think you've, you've already answered some of these. Um, what, what, who was your favorite teacher growing up and why? <laughs> Mrs. Landrum, Doris Landrum. She was my fourth grade teacher and she created a news team every day. I was expected to help deliver the news and she made me the captain. I, you won't make me believe this, but I was very shy and retiring as a kid. I just tried to hide and stay in the background and she forced me to the limelight and made me leave. And I just, oh, I was just like, why me? I don't want to do this. But I, <laughs> she saw something in me. And so it really was my first leadership opportunity beyond my family circle, right? Pushed me out of my comfort zone. Uh, she was probably my very favorite teacher. And uh, I, I'm so thankful for her. I wish I could thank her today, but she's, you know, she's on to her next adventure on the other side. Maybe I'll get to thank her one day. Hmm. Do you think she, do you, did she know as you went on through the grades, did she know what you had accomplished? And I, I don't think she found out. I was trying my best to get a hold of her and then I was too late. So I want to encourage our listeners, if you have a teacher like that, make the time and let them know because um, it will mean the world to them, I know. You know, it's funny. I ask, I ask all of our podcast guests this question, and it's so interesting to me how many of them name a fourth grade teacher. Really? Isn't that interesting? I think fourth grade must be a pivotal year for us because a lot of us have that fourth grade teacher experience. Right? That's amazing. Well, so thank you, Mrs. Landrum. We appreciate you. <laughs> thank you. Um, now, you may have already answered this one. What is a favorite book, either as a child or an adult? I know you mentioned um, Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe series. You mentioned Little Women. Um, you mentioned uh, Maya Angelou. Are there any others you want to share that were favorites for you? Uh, I really do want to encourage um, leaders to think about reading two books. One is Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. So you know how to have those fierce conversations and in a way that's respectful and builds the kind of culture. And I'm learning it. I mean, I'm, I'm a disciple of Brene trying to learn the work. The other one is um, When to Walk Away. Um, that book talks about toxic relationships, whether it's work-related, um, Gary Thomas is the author, work-related, family-related, because we, I believe we all have a destiny. And if there's someone or something that's sucking the life out of you, energy vampires, taking your purpose from you, you need to know how to create those boundaries and when to walk away. And it has been a life-changing book for me. 
Interesting. Well, I'll, and I'll be putting all these in the show notes too, so so people can can follow these threads. Um, and I wanted to mention, Brene Brown also has a podcast. Yes, yes, she does. Highly okay. encourage it. Very, very powerful work. And research-based, which I think is just phenomenal. Uh, life-changing work she's doing. What do you have on your desk that symbolizes you or is dear to you? Let's see. I'm, this doesn't, well, this is my daughter's pencil sharpener. I love my kids. I have twin boys who are 21 and they just graduated from college. And then I have a 16 year old who's my surprise baby. Um, and I just adore them. They're all miracles. Um, I, I, I wasn't expecting, I had a trouble with, with giving birth, but um, I got double the blessing with my twins when I was 38. And then when I was in my 40s at 42, my oldest twin said, mommy, we have too many boys in this family. We need a girl. And I laughed and I said, well, sweetie, you're going to have to pray about that. And that little boy laid hands on me and said, in the name of Jesus. And he started to pray fervently for his sister. And the next thing I know, I'm pregnant and had her at 43. So I would say this, you know, my children, my dreams for them are, it is that they will carry this legacy of, of caring for our community forward, find their purpose in their path, and just be those change agents to take it to the next level. That's my hope. And I just, I'm so thankful I got to have children. And I, and I feel like that's, that's not only your hope for your own children, it's your hope for everybody's children. Every child. Absolutely. Yeah. And you have, you have a son that's um, going to Chicago for graduate school? Yes, yes. I have one going for a master's in screenwriting at DePaul. I'm so proud of him for pursuing his dreams. And and another one who's exploring, well, they're both um, being certified to teach. One is, is a go and the other one's getting ready to take his exams. But um, it will be interesting to see if anybody walks in my footsteps. We'll see. We'll see. Fingers crossed. And um, maybe law, like dad is a lawyer, so law professor. Um, but definitely, you know, I love that the research says that children will likely reach the aspirational goals of mom. So I wanted to be the first in my family to earn a doctorate, but not just just for me, but for them to show if she can do it, surely I can do it. And it's possible. But my goodness, I had to push against fear. I had to really push hard against fear uh, to, to go the distance on that. Yeah. So glad I did it. So glad you did. Well, if, you're, if your son needs an auntie in Chicago, you know who to call. Honorary aunties are welcome. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, this is just, Tracy, this has been so delightful. And I just, I'm, I'm just, I feel really blessed to have had this conversation with you today. You're really an inspiration. Um, and I, I know that this will be an episode that our listeners will really appreciate and love and cherish. So thank you so much for your time honored to be with you, Laura, and thank you for your service to our community and being a voice of hope. You're welcome. Thank you very much. This podcast, I hardly have the words to express how much this affected me, and I'm guessing it affected you as well. You know, we at the Reading League are committed to bringing you these important conversations. If you enjoyed this, please share it out. We want other people to hear Tracy's wise and wonderful words. And please rate us, provide us with feedback. That feedback is really important to us. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for viewing. And we'll see you next time.